Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to CHK Law and the latest in our legal history uh, seminars. Um, I'm very pleased today to be introducing our speaker, uh, who, um, well, I met some nine years ago now in Hawaii, uh, and where he was telling the story of this incredible wreck uh, and the history of this wreck, which really links together uh, New Zealand, uh, China, Hong Kong, and shows how important I think shipwrecks are um, as evidence of our humankind's uh, cultural heritage and the links between us all. So let me just introduce our speaker briefly to you, Keith Gordon. Uh, well, he's over in New Zealand at the moment. He's a New Zealander who lives in Auckland in New Zealand. He's a pioneer underwater explorer with extensive underwater and shipwreck ex exploration experience. He's an international fellow of the Explorers Club and president of the New Zealand Underwater Heritage Group. Keith has a keen interest in maritime heritage. Underwater expeditions have taken him to remote parts of the Pacific, Southeast Asia and the Aegean to search for and explore historical shipwrecks. Keith is the author and publisher of Apart from the book on the SS Ventnor, also Deepwater Gold, the story of the RMS Niagara. He's also co-author of New Zealand Shipwrecks, which is in its eighth edition and has published numerous magazine articles on maritime her historical and heritage topics. Uh, Keith also has some family links to Hong Kong as well, which make it very appropriate for him to be talking us, to us uh, in Hong Kong today. And of course, apart from that, I'd like to welcome uh, our very many participants today from, well, all over the world, actually. We have people from China uh, and from uh, the United States joining us as well today. So thank you for everyone joining in. With no further ado, then I'll hand over to Keith. And I think that Keith's daughter, Kim, is going to give us a, a brief Maori prayer to start the seminar. So over to you, Keith and Kim. So I'm Keith Steve, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or kia ora, as we say now in New Zealand. Um, yeah, Steve, I thank the university for arranging this seminar today, and I welcome you all uh, to my presentation, which is actually based on my uh, recently published book, um, S.S. Ventnor, um, Shipwreck, uh, ghost, ship, ghost Ship of the Hokianga. And uh, before we uh, get started, yes, I, uh, Kim, my daughter here, will say a kia kia, a kara kia, uh, which is a Maori prayer, and uh, which will, she is saying maybe to honour those uh, Chinese miners who were lost in the wreck of the, uh, of the uh, Ventnor, and also to the Maori people who looked after the remains uh, of the Chinese miners that were washed ashore soon after the uh, uh, ship sank. Uh, Kim, please, if you... Okay. Thanks, Dad. All right, so um, we've got the words in English so you can understand the meaning as well for the karakia. Tutara mai uronga, tutara mai iraro, tutawa mai iroto, to tawa mai iwaho. Kia tau ai, ki te Māori tu, te Māori ora. Ki te katoa, haumie, huie, taikie. Thank you, Kim. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been involved with the uh, shipwreck of the event now since uh, 2012. And uh, the, um, the ship was lost off the coast of uh, New Zealand in uh, 1902. And uh, we still am involved with various events surrounding the shipwreck. And unfortunately, we have also have ongoing controversy over our discovery of the wreck and of the human remains of the Chinese miners that were found in the wreck. Um, before we uh, before we start the uh, the story on the Vietnam, perhaps a little bit of history um, behind the Vietnam's uh, connection with Hong Kong and southern China, uh, which perhaps uh, may have really uh, started back in the eighteen sixties. The uh, back uh, in the 1850s, of course, the 
following the uh, Red Turban Rebellion and other um, other uh, events of of uh, conflict and that, many Chinese from the Guangdong province left uh, their families and traveled across to uh, California uh, to the new Dumshang, the uh, gold mountain, in, to seek their fortune and hopefully return to China and support their families. In, uh, in fact, in, 1880, in the period 1867 to 1877, there were more than 100,000 across the Pacific seeking their, uh, their, their, their fortune on. But um, when uh, gold was discovered in Victoria, Australia in the 18, uh, 1850s, late 1850s, there was a rush of uh, uh, men and miners down to uh, the new Gumshan. And by 1857, uh, there were more than 26 Chinese miners working on the Victorian gold fields. Then in 1861, gold was discovered in the province of, Ot of Otago in the South Island of New Zealand. That brought a rush across to New Zealand. But as, as, gold, uh, as the gold sort of became harder to get, many left for richer pickings. And the Otago uh, provincial government wanting to expand the gold fields and develop uh, invited Chinese uh, miners from Victoria to come across and work these uh, fields. And in 1866, uh, uh, in, in um, uh, 12, uh, there was a group of 12 Chinese miners came across. And by 1869, this has increased to over 2,000 uh, Chinese miners uh, working the fields. And by 1881, we had over uh, 5,000 Chinese miners in Otago. It, uh, it was a harsh existence for them down there uh, in the south. The uh, bitter, bitter cold winters, the, um, they lived in harsh primitive conditions and uh, work was very hard, remote. Many of them got sick. A lot decided to uh, change their occupation. And they, they started uh, businesses such as market gardening, laundries and such. And, and many of these people became, were the forebears of many of the Chinese families now living in New Zealand. Um. The, uh, the, uh, the one of the uh, people that came at that time was a man named Choi Su Hoi. He had previously been to the gold fields in California and Victoria, and he, he came across to uh, New Zealand in 1868, and he saw opportunity to Dunedin, which is in the uh, province of uh, Targo. It's uh, where most of the miners would arrive on land from the ships. And he saw uh, prospects there, and rather than go mining, he set up a business in 1869 in Dunedin. And uh, in fact, uh, the building uh, that he established back then is still in existence today in Dunedin, and it's still been operated by the, the Su Hoi family. Choi Su Hoi, he, he dropped the uh, surname Choi, and he was sort of known locally as uh, Charles Su Hoi. But today, uh, the Su Hoi family are very prominent, very large in New Zealand and business and uh, academic world and, and such like. So, and he has quite a connection, as you will see, uh, with our subject, the, uh, the vessel uh, Ventnor. And he, he was a very, uh, quite, quite a, um, uh, an innovative man too. And, uh, at the same time with his 
background in gold before he saw opportunities uh, for the trying to get gold from the uh, from the depths of the rivers of Otago. He came up with the idea of making a dredge, a uh, gold dredge to work those rivers. In fact, it was the first gold dredge in the world. And from his design, many followed. Unfortunately, he didn't patent the design. And uh, uh, these dredges became worldwide. But he uh, was quite a, uh, a uh, fair, he, which brought in a lot of people many riches working those gold, gold fields. And in uh, the, the, with the Chinese community uh, increasing uh, in numbers, in 1882, the Cheong Sing Tong uh, was formed. And uh, they were headquartered in Dunedin, and their headquarters were at uh, Choi Su Hoi's shop. In fact, he became uh, the leader of the Tong. And the, uh, at the time, uh, many of the Chinese miners, of course, they were away from home. Their, uh, their intent was to make their fortune and uh, then return back to China and uh, provide for their families as rich, well, hopefully as rich men. But on the minds of many was the thought that if they died in a foreign country, um, they would, would have problems that uh, the belief was, unless your remains, your bones were returned to your ancestral village, you would become a, uh, a, a wandering ghost. And um, it was more or less uh, looked upon as being uh, returning the, uh, with the leaves returning to the roots of the tree. So the Cheong Sheng Tong was set up to provide assistance to the miners, uh, the members in their time of need. The majority of these people, the miners had come from uh, southern China, from the province of uh, Guangdong, and more so from Upper Pan Yu. And they would pay a, uh, a fee or rather regular payments to the Cheong Sheng Tong. In case they did die, uh, their remains would be, uh, the Tong, the society would uh, take care of that and return their uh, remains to their ancestral villages in, um, in China, more mainly China, uh, southern China. And anyway, so they, one of the, pro they set up, they did a first shipment in 1883 of, of, uh, on a vessel called the Hoi Hao to Hong Kong, which was the gateway for these um, uh, people, remains to be returned to. There uh, was a, uh, where you still have over there, I, I believe, uh, the, the facilities that, that did handle um, the remains when they arrived there, and then they would be, be sent, upon, sent on to the uh, villages uh, from where these people came. And um, so the Hoi Hao, it, it did a trip, they did, uh, had a number, I think it was about 286 uh, remains of 286 people were transported on the Hoi Hao to Hong Kong, quite a successful village uh, trip. Uh, at the time, too, this uh, earlier, the, the, because of uh, the large numbers of Chinese, also miners in California, there was quite a, a business of a similar of transporting uh, Chinese uh, workers and the miners across to California. And hopefully, uh, if they made their fortune and returned to uh, return across the Pacific from California back to China, but also in the carriage, similarly, of, uh, of those that uh, had passed away. We just go back to that one. And, and just one incident that uh, of interest is this ship, the, um, the Japan. It was a side wheeler, one of the giant side wheelers that were in use across the Pacific. 
it on on its return returning to um, uh, China, it caught fire off the coast as it was approaching Hong Kong, and uh, the it the fire destroyed the ship, and there were uh, a large number of uh, Chinese uh, uh, that um, died from the sinking. In fact, it, it is. Uh, a, uh, it's recorded as the largest uh, number of U.S. immigrant Chinese uh, to have been lost, and uh, still today. But so some of these trips, uh, they weren't always successful in in, uh, in returning those remains to China. Anyway, uh, following the following the the success of the Hoi Hao and its uh, shipment to China uh, to Hong Kong. The Chong Sing Tong um, planned to send a further shipment of remains in 1902. In the meantime, uh, Choi Su Hoi, he had passed away in 1901. And uh, his son, um, uh, Plum Choi uh, Su Hoi, he, he had taken over as uh, the head of the uh, society and they arranged the shipment in Dunedin. Uh, there was uh, a, quite a, um, a quite a uh, project of exhuming bodies of miners from graves around the country, especially around Otago, and preparing them for shipment back to uh, China. Um, the ones from Dunedin, they, they uh, transported to Wellington uh, on the North Island on the Rimu, which is seen here. Uh, the photograph is Kumpoi Chu Hoi. He's the, uh, on the left there. And the upper image is of members of the Cheong Sing Tong overseeing the um, loading of the, uh, of the uh, remains onto the, uh, the Rimu for their transport to Wellington from uh, port Chalmers, which is the port of uh, Dunedin. You'll notice two large caskets there. Uh, Choi Su Hoi, uh, Kampo had arranged for him to be put, his remains to be closed in an elaborate rimu, uh, that's a native timber of New Zealand um, coffin. And uh, uh, most of the others were uh, in, in various, uh, not, not so elaborate, boxes and that mainly they were made the bones of the remains that have been specially prepared and uh Choi Su Hoi uh his coffin was placed uh when it went to um uh Wellington it was to be placed in a separate compartment on the ship that was going to transport them to Hong Kong uh, the ship that was arranged uh was the SS Ventnor it had come to New Zealand with a uh, cargo of sugar and uh, went down the west coast of the South Island and to uplift a cargo of over 5,000 tonnes of fast-burning coal uh, that was to take back to Hong Kong uh, for the uh, British Naval Station at that time. Uh, the coal was uh, recognised as a very high quality. So the ship was also chartered to carry the remains of the uh, Chinese miners from Otago. And the total uh, number uh, was 499. That's uh, the recorded number. Now, they, they, as I say, they were shipped to Wellington. Um, well, first of all, we'll just have a, a look at these. So some details on the Ventnor. You can see it was only built, it was only a year old, it was built in 1901. It was operated by a, a Scottish company and uh, and it had the 5,300 tonnes of coal and 499 coffins. And the, uh, it was captained by uh, Captain uh, Henry Ferry. The, uh, the ship is uh, shown here on the map. Uh, it was it departed Wellington on, on October the uh, uh, 
uh, 26 and 1902. And one interesting uh, report is too that the Captain Ferry had been involved with carrying remains before uh, across the Pacific and that to uh, Hong Kong. And in recognition of this event, or was uh, permitted to fly the uh, Chinese um, imperial dragon flag at the time, which was the, uh, the main flag of China at the time. The, uh, the ship departed Wellington and uh, was heading, headed to go to, uh, uh, to direct to Hong Kong. But uh, as it went up the coast of the North Island, it struck a reef through bad navigation and it uh, started taking on water. So uh, they made a decision. Uh, okay, they thought that it wasn't leaking too bad. They thought they were, they would get up around the top of the North Island there and down to Auckland where there was a dry dock facilities. So as they headed up the coast, she took the ship took on more water, more water, and finally off the uh, off the coast of Hokianga Harbour, up near the top of the North Island, the ship uh, the ship uh, sank. Uh, and um, and uh, there was uh, the before it sank, they they knew they they weren't going to make it. So four lifeboats were launched. Well, one uh, point too, uh, with regard to the uh, the remains that were on board, uh, there was also um, nine elderly Chinese body servants uh, were on board to tend to the, uh, uh, to the remains that they were carrying. And okay, when the ship sank, uh, there was four lifeboats were launched, but one lifeboat uh, carrying 13, including the captain and uh, five of the body attendants um, went down with the ship. They didn't get clear in time. So there was 13 lost uh, with the sinking. The others, they rode, they were off the coast of the Hokianga. It was night time, but they, they rode their boats and got through the barrier into the uh, Hokianga Harbour. And uh, this is a, a photograph of the survivors uh, on the beach in the Hokianga Harbour. You'll notice uh, there was a fairly mixed nationality of crew there. The Hokianga Harbour is, they were lucky, uh, they struck at a, a calm night, as you can see, she can get pretty stirred up going through the, the bar that uh, crosses the entrance to the harbour into the sheltered uh, waters beyond. Um, it's quite a daunting uh, task. Anyway, um, the ship sank and uh, very little was, uh, it was, it's a rather isolated area back in 1902. It still is in some ways, a very, very beautiful area. Local Maori, uh, uh, who had uh, their uh, villages and that along the coast, um, they came across uh, boxes of remains of bones. Some boxes got washed up onto their shores. And... Um, they realized that they must have come off this uh, sunken ship. So they buried them um, alongside their own people with, in their, uh, in their uh, villages. But it, it all sort of got forgotten. And uh, it wasn't until recent times that uh, more interest came. We knew from our point of view, we knew that, that this ship the Hoki, uh, the uh, Ventnor had sunk off the Hokianga, but was in fairly deep water. So no attempt was ever made to uh, locate the boat. But after it actually sank, there was quite an effort to try and locate the wreck by the, uh, the Chinese, by the Chiangsing Kong and the insurance companies and that. And they spent some, some months actually uh, searching for it with the uh, limited equipment they had back in those days, but were unable to find the ship. But it was known it was sunk off the coast and uh, 
and it got forgotten in a lot of ways. There was always sorry uh, with the Marys there. You know, they used to tell the kids, even you know, this is in recent times. Hey, hey, boys, you got to behave yourself, otherwise the ghosts from the ships will come and get you. So <laughs> it was uh, anyway. Uh, where we came and where I came involved, um, we uh, met one of the Mary um, people from up there, uh, a character that was uh, um, John Albert, his name. He he used to visit his relatives up there, and he had heard the stories of of the ship, the ghost ship, as they would call it, and he was involved with making documentaries. And he thought, well, there's a bit of a story here, too. So he decided he would try and make a documentary. But first of all, he, he needed to find the wreck of the ship because without the wreck, there was a story. It was difficult to put a, uh, a documentary together. So that's where uh, uh, we came into it. He approached us and said, hey, uh, told us of his uh, plan and asked if it was possible if we could find the ship. So we said, well, okay, it's a big area out there. Uh, it was some uh, 22 kilometres offshore. And uh, for some time, um, we there was very little recorded as to where the ship might actually be. But then uh, after some time, we uh, learnt of a, a, a couple that uh, ran fishing charters out there, and they thought they knew where the wreck was because they'd been fishing what they had originally thought was a reef, and they'd been getting some good fish up off it. And uh, But they noticed on their fishing lines at times that they uh, were getting uh, rust and remarks of it, and one time they pulled up a piece of railing, so they thought, well, there's more than a reef down there. So they informed us of this, so we... So we ultimately, back in 2012, just before in December, just before the end of the year, went out uh, with them. And on their echo sounder, we we saw the image on the uh, on the uh, screen there, uh, on their echo sounder, and thought, well, that's that's not a reef, that's a shipwreck. So we followed up a, about a month later uh, and took uh, a rotor operated vehicle out. And uh, it was the depth was around 150 meters. So it was sort of beyond just jumping over the side with an aqualung on or that and swimming down. So with the ROV, it was a rather quick trip. We put the ROV down and uh, sure enough, we... Can we just... Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, we we did find yes it was definitely the shipwreck a shipwreck that was sitting upright, um, and we and we knew and then there was quite a bit of coal uh, scattered around the seabed around it, and of course uh, we knew well really there's only one ship out there that uh, um, of this size and that would be the Ventnor, so. John, uh, he was quite excited and he wanted to keep our discovery quiet while he made his plans. Uh, and this uh, image here is just one that taken a natural light from one of the cameras on the ROV and it's looking down on, onto the wreck as we're coming up. In fact, it's natural light uh, at about 150 metres or 140 metres or so, but it, it's, it's showing what's called the donkey boiler uh, which supplied steam for the winches and stuff and the collapsed deck and collapsed superstructure around it. So we were sure, yes, we had found the vent wall. So uh, we made plans to explore it more. And um, at that depth, we, we decided uh, we had uh, an associate uh, technical divers who, who were qualified and experienced at diving to depths uh, well, beyond 150 metres. So uh, so we put together a uh, project where we uh, uh, went up there with the divers and um, we're using special rebreather equipment and mixed gases and uh, sent them down and uh, 
to, to uh, see what they could find. Uh, the picture on the left there is a diver going down but using the scooters and the first one to arrive on, on the wreck itself. Um, they were, to, to do a dive to this depth, they were very limited on time on the bottom and they were using a, a breathing mixture of, of, I think it was 7% oxygen, 70% uh, helium and the rest nitrogen to overcome the effects of nitrogen narcosis and of oxygen, oxygen toxicity at such depths. So from then on, we put a plan together to um, uh, to explore the wreck. But now one, one of the main things that John was mainly interested for his film and was to locate the remains of, of the 499 uh, miners that were uh, originally on board the ship. So over a period of time where the diver, we the divers explored the ship trying to find uh, these remains. They, um, we, um, as I say, uh, they could only really spend about um, spend about thirty minutes on the well, less than twenty five minutes or so on the wreck, and it would require uh, their decompression time in the water maybe six seven hours. Sometimes it was longer, and um, so in that little time, they on a on a number of dives, uh, we covered. Uh, a uh, quite a bit of um, uh, of the wreck. Um, we we had plans, and one of the earlier reports uh, of uh, when the ship first sailed, when the vent door was, there was reports that the uh, the body attendants they had been housed in special accommodation on the poop deck, which was above. Uh, where the, the bodies were stored. And they were, the bodies had been, the coffins had been stored on racks, more or less. And, uh, and Sue Hoy was in a, uh, a special compartment. Now, the poop deck on a, uh, a ship is, is that deck right down at the back of the ship there. Uh, it, it comes just circling it there. So, so most of the concentration of, um, searching the, uh, the wreck was more or less from the midships. Uh, that's where the tunnel is there, back in the areas, back towards the stern. Okay, the, the, two, the two holds back there, three and four, with a found were full of coal. And, uh, and while the poop deck area, most of the, a lot of the structure had gone and uh, collapsed. The um, as you can see there, the, the ship was pretty well broken up. It, it, over the years, trawlers had um, had uh, created quite a bit of damage, dragged. There wasn't much superstructure left. And um, keep going, it'll stop. Sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of it. It's all right. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We just got an interruption here, but we'll, it's okay now. It's good. Can we go to the next one, Kim? So with the divers explored around the wreck and uh, this, you can see that some of the outside hull plating had, had uh, fallen away from the rivets had uh, corroded and that and that, that allowed them to look into the interior of the wreck from the outside, but mainly you know, what they could see was deposits of coal. As you can see, the diver, he's carrying uh, quite a bit of equipment. Uh, we, we have cameras, a rebreather, backup equipment and that in case of uh, emergency. And it was quite an exercise, actually, especially working at the at such depths. Uh, sorry, and the, the, you can see, like, there's that donkey boiler there on the top left there that uh, would supply steam for the winches and that. The other picture on the top right is of the funnel and with the boilers, which uh, pretty well collapsed. And as the lower pictures shows. Pretty well, all the superstructure had gone. And uh, you see, the aft mast had fallen, and uh, there's a picture there of that. And as we explored around, uh, came down to the propeller, um, the ship was sitting upright. 
And uh, well, one of the interesting things was uh, the rudder there. Uh, it, it is hard to starboard. And uh, the divers also found the uh, rudder indicator. No, we got and, um, and it was showing, yes, hard to starboard. Uh, we didn't recover that. It's still down on the wreck. But the other, other interesting thing, too, was, uh, was the hinge points on the rudder there, which although don't look much here, but we had plans of, of the rudder, which was a special patented setup, uh, especially the hinges there. So that, that was one proof that we, because we kept getting questions, oh, how do you know it's the vent or and that? So the idea was to try and find some artifacts. Uh, people were expecting us to find a name, but you don't find a name on a wreck. But sometimes for the artifacts, you can relate them back uh, to that particular ship. But also, as you'll note, there was a lot of fishing nets caught around there showing that the trawlers in the past had dragged and probably created quite a bit of damage to the uh, uh, to the shipwreck itself. And during the search, you know, as I said, though, we were trying to search for bones. Well, one, in one incident, the diver, a diver came up and he says, I think I've found bones. Oh, it's quite a big excitement. And he says, are oh, they in urns? And we said, well, yeah, that there had been sort of reports that uh, this this was a, uh, a custom sometimes. So <laughs> anyway, after a bit of research and Google, we had some photographs there, and uh, it it set up quite a uh, a bit of uh, uh, interest. Even the New Zealand police got involved. That yes, uh, they must come out next time we go and we to bring up bring up these urns uh, so they can check whether it's bones or not. But in the meantime, we Googled the, the name on the, uh, on, the, um, on the urns and found that they were, in fact, were water filters and they had a carbon type thing. So that put the end of that. So there was a lot of artifacts lying around exposed on, on the wreck, as you can see in the lower photo, dishes and plates, a porthole. Uh, it's amazing how China, uh, like, um, let's say uh, crockery will even with on the uh, on the destruction of the ship can still stay intact. There's a porthole there. But one of one of the things we uh, well the divers came across was a telegraph from the bridge laying down uh, laying on the amongst the remains. And uh, thought well okay it might have a maker's serial number and other things on it which can help to prove uh, that, yes, this is the Ventnor. So we recovered that, sent it to the surface, as you can see there, with a lift bag arrangement. Uh, and, and recovered uh, about five main artifacts, including that, uh, that uh, telegraph. And you can see here there was a small bell, um, very heavily corroded, and after uh, doing the conservation work, uh, you can see what, uh, uh, what, what resulted. Uh, it was in pretty bad shape, but we managed to save it. And then the lower photograph is of a lamp uh, type of thing, and once again, uh, in quite bad shape. And the uh, next one. And a porthole, we brought up a porthole and uh, did some conservation on that. And then also a very delicate, very fine uh, ceramic uh, or, or plate and uh, clean that up. And it's interesting when you hold it in a certain light, you can see a pattern on it or mainly of an oriental um, uh, scene. Um, so whether this was part of the um, Chinese attendants, uh, body servants, uh, utensils or what they might have used as part of their um, uh, rituals uh, in uh, with the uh, bodies and that uh, with the remains we don't know but uh, it was it's very fine china so so those, those five items the um, the telegraph the the bell the lamp holder and the plate and the porthole they become known as the uh, Ventnor objects. And uh, the media uh, got a hold of this. It stirred up quite a bit of controversy around uh, New Zealand, especially from 
uh, some members of the New Zealand Chinese Association, um, that uh, they felt that uh, we were interfering or the divers were interfering with the remains of the bodies, but they weren't. We hadn't found any remains. And in fact, we were getting to the point that we felt that uh, uh, with the destruction, of, and especially down that um, stern, the poop deck, that these remains might not be on the board of the ship anymore. They might be in the debris field, dragged off by trawlers as such. So uh, we were starting, and especially with all the search that had been done by the divers, we was starting to believe that perhaps, um, uh, you know, they weren't there anymore. But at the same time, uh, the on learning a bit more about the vent, or uh, a bit earlier, the New Zealand Chinese Association and members, they had. Um, uh, established the memorials or to the uh, uh, the lost ship in a nearby uh, forest area, which was very, uh, has a very spiritual uh, um, thing with Maori, uh, Waipua, just just near the Hokianga. Uh, there's giant um, kauri trees there, some 2,000 years old or so. And they, they set up a, what they call the Ventnor Grove, of, uh, planted some young kauri trees and put some stones there and with these um, uh, with these uh, other items and you can see that as well as the inscriptions there it's not just uh, in English it, it, it's in Chinese Maori and uh, English and you'll notice there that uh, the descendants of the Poon Fa and Jung Sing districts and at at the same time, uh, some of the families had set up uh, what they call uh, tree donors board and for visitors could get just sticks uh, for a coin donation. The, the majority, as you'll notice, there's uh, some Sue Hoy there, but they, Joy Sue Hoy was the only really known um, person to have had his remains on that ship. The rest, uh, no, there was no no record of, of the names that um, uh, that had made up that 499, but they, they was well known about Chu Sui Hoi, Chu Su Hoi was on board. But, um, so uh, there was a lot of controversy about our diving or, or the exploring of the shipwrecks trying to, but as I said, the, one of the main reasons was to film, film the ship as part of doing a documentary. Anyway, the, uh, this went on for a while, for a few years, and uh, there was, uh, uh, as I say, a lot of controversy. Uh, the New Zealand, the New Zealand Chinese Association approached our uh, Ministry of Culture and Heritage to Heritage New Zealand and expressed their um, concerns that divers were diving this wreck, although uh, majority of divers wouldn't be able to dive it. It was only a specialist team like we had. And the situation with the shipwreck like the Ventnor, we, we have a law in New Zealand that ships that are sunk prior to 1900 are automatically deemed to be archaeological sites. And you can't bring anything up from them or, or alter them or destroy them and that. Uh, but you can dive them and take photographs. Now, the, the Ventnor, as I say, sank in 1902, so it wasn't an archaeological site. But in answer to a lot of the criticisms and concerns, the New Zealand government, uh, with the uh, Heritage New Zealand, uh, gazetted the wreck of the Ventnor as an archaeological site. It, it was, it's the first time this has ever happened to a wreck in New Zealand. And all this was done in a big hurry. So, okay, that didn't prevent us still from going and filming on the wreck or exploring, uh, although uh, there was moves to try and even prevent that. Uh, there was accusations that uh, uh, we were bringing up bones and selling skulls and that, which was, which was crazy because, as I say, we hadn't even discovered any remains. And our divers, uh, we're very uh, professional people. 
uh, two of them that, uh, especially to dive those sort of depths, and, and two, two of them, for instance, uh, Richard Harris and, uh, and, and Craig Challen, uh, they're from Australia, and uh, some of you have probably seen the film of the, uh, or the documentaries of that, the rescue of the boys, the Thai soccer team boys in the caves, the flooded caves in Thailand. Well, Richard Harris, uh, or Harry, as we call him, he, he's the guy that uh, went into that those cave system and actually applied the uh, the injections to those uh, boys to to bring them out. And Craig was also um, involved with uh, extracting those uh, young young boys out. So th they they were quite. Uh, uh, people of, of uh, good standing, not, not sort of wreck divers or sort of pirates or, or out to uh, souvenir. Uh, they were there as, uh, you know, with, the, with part of the project just to, um, to carry out what the project was all about. But anyway, um, COVID came along and that um, put a stop a bit to the explorations. And... Uh, but after we were back in uh, 2021, then we got a break from COVID. We could get back out to the wreck. And uh, this time we took out a uh, another ROV, quite a more sophisticated one than we'd used the years before, and, and did a dive down onto the, um, the first dive down onto the wreck. And we got some films that, like, for instance, it filmed, as you see in that top right-hand corner, is, is a fracture in the hull. And that's up near the bow. Where the ROV uh, where we positioned ended up that we're up in the bow area. And that fracture had happened uh, when the ship sank, it sank uh, bow first. And when the bow hit the hit the seabed, of course, it caused the damage that fractured that uh, bow. Also in the area we came in was this magnificent black coral um, growth, which we hadn't really seen before on the other dives uh, or been recorded. And uh, so this it was all up around that bow area. Anyway, flying the ROV along a little bit further over the deck, it came came across an opening that that you could go down into the interior of the wreck. As I said, most of the other holds were, were full of coal, but uh, this was quite forward up near the bow. So the ROV uh, dived down, and uh, straight away there were the we'd only just been in the water about uh, twenty minutes or so. And uh, as, as it descended and, and to that area, uh, the other thing of uh, uh, that happened, a big albatross landed alongside the uh, ship, which was quite uncommon for that area. And then that was joined by another one. And at the same time as we were watching the screen uh, from the ROV, because we were receiving video in real time, uh, suddenly, Here's these remains, bones there. And so we came across uh, 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 the area where they had been stored. And there was a large amount of, of uh, bones exposed, scattered around amongst the wreckage. Uh, coffins had well gone, but, but we, we were very surprised to suddenly come across this and also the condition of, of those bones at the time. So, we filmed a little bit, but then left them alone and uh, and finished doing a bit of exploration around the wreck, and uh, and uh, we, we uh, finished the dive and uh, reported the finding of these bones. And unlike that time when we thought we'd found uh, bone remains uh, a few years earlier, which was in that filter. Back then, it caused quite a big uh, hullabaloo in a way with the police and that involved. We got very little reaction. Okay, it was reported in the papers, it was that, but nobody actually came, the police or the Chinese Association or, or heritage people came to ask us uh, for to see the films or to see what happened. And uh, we were a bit concerned about that, but um, we thought, well, okay, uh, here, here's the remains. They are on the wreck. Uh, so what happens now? And um, but since then, uh, they're still there. It's uh, the question is, uh, so I'll bring up a bit more later. That um, 
uh, no decision as yet. But back in, uh, at the same time, not long after the New Zealand Chinese Association, they uh, had got funding and uh, New Zealand government also gave them funding to build a memorial in the Hokianga back in the harbour alongside the water uh, to commemorate the sinking of the, uh, the Ventnor. And uh, it's a magnificent structure in some ways. It, it sort of resembles the wreck and that, and uh, the plaques there that uh, record all the names, say what happened with the original records of, of, um, of the remains that were on the vent and all got lost in a fire um, in a storage area. Yes. What was recorded was the, the names of their angular sized names there was a record of that, and all the names are on that uh, on that memorial, and you can see some of them there. And as I say, uh, anglicised, but the only real name is still that anybody has shows a connection to was Choi Su Hoi, and there was since been one other, and and there's been a little research, but but who these people were and who their relatives are. Back in Guangdong, especially in the Panyu area, the, as I say, these are many nicknames. So there's a big problem in trying to um, in trying to confirm who their families are back in China. And uh, anyway, with with the uh, the memorial, the establishment of it, uh, there was quite a big ceremony with the um, uh, dedication of it. Uh, there was a lot of New Zealand government people came. It was from various organisations, the Chinese uh, Association, Maori. Maori played a big part in it. Um, and uh, you can see it was a very wet day that day. Uh, we were there. And uh, on the lower photograph on the left, uh, this uh, ex, uh, he was the former... Uh, Vice uh, Deputy. President of, um, I'm sorry, Prime Minister of New Zealand, Winston Peters, and uh, also one of the other MPs. Uh, there was presentations done where Murray, um, the carved Murray uh, weapon, uh, traditional thing, was handed there to the Chinese Association of Representatives. Um, so it was, there was a, a the uh, white line dance done at the memorial. And uh, quite as I'm told, it was the first time this had been done in New Zealand, and the burning of the uh, of the lion at the uh, tomb at the uh, memorial afterwards. So it created big interest, but not but there wasn't at any time mentioned about okay, we've got remains out there, are there of the 400? How are we going for time? They can That's seven minutes. Yeah, <laughs> almost done. Okay, for the. 499. So, okay, where are we going there? Uh, the, uh, but the, it is a magnificent uh, memorial and uh, it, it is located at a, um, a, a major uh, Maori uh, heritage uh, exhibition and uh, will attract quite a few uh, uh, tourists. And uh, two or three years earlier to a um, a New Zealand uh, film company, a government film company, along with uh, two Chinese uh, film companies, they did do a, uh, a documentary called The Lost Voyage of the 499. And you can, uh, you can find that on, uh, online uh, and view it. And um, so it tells a bit of a story about uh, Chu Hoi's uh, grandson, Duncan there, uh, about his pilgrimage back to Shao Kong, um, their home village, um, to their home, which is still there, and um, their home home village, and to the old homestead, which is still there, and uh, the, with his saying that yes, they must return Choi Su Hoi's remains back to his village of Shao Kong. 
But uh, as I say, there is a lot of opposition now on uh, what is to be done or whether they should be left where they are. At the same time, I published my book here, uh, telling the story and uh, a lot of what happened, um, <laughs> the conflicts between the various groups. That, But it's interesting, back in Sha Kong there, the Suhoi, there is still a grave there waiting. A, a Fung Mu has been rigged by the family some years ago, uh, waiting. It's empty, but waiting for the remains of Choi Su Hoi. Uh, some years back, a, a silver plaque was sent there, which is being buried there, which which is to represent the spirit of uh, Choi Su Hoi. So there, there's a lot of feeling, and I know I've spoken to some of the Su Hoi family. They would like the remains of their great grandfather returned to. Uh, Sha Kong and to be buried here at the Fung Mu that awaits his return. So his spirit can be at peace and he is not a wandering ghost anymore. And uh, at the other, uh, at Miti Miti, uh, this is a Maori uh, settlement just north of the Hokianga where a lot of the, uh, uh, well, not a lot, where some of the bones ended up being washed ashore after the sinking. And the Marys have uh, back then did bury them in their own burial grounds and looked after it, which was only found out later. The um, New Zealand Chinese Association have also erected what they call the Red Gate Memorial. And th this picture here depicts the, it was a visiting Buddhist priest from China and he here is giving a blessing. This looks out over the sea where the, the ship was lost. On the left is a uh, Mary Kaumata, a priest, and he also uh, um, recites uh, the Mary Kiakia, uh, Karakia in memory of, the, uh, of those lost souls. In the end, uh, this is one of the plaques on the, um, on the uh, memorial. And uh, as I said, the the remains are still there in the uh, in the wreck, which is disintegrating in 150 meters of water. There's been silence, more or less, on uh, on what should happen uh, to those remains. And uh, at the same time, the um, those five objects that were recovered or artifacts recovered from the um, uh, the Ventnor, they are now housed at the National Museum in Wellington, but they're in storage. And uh, there's been no decision how they should be uh, uh, displayed either. And we're hoping that they will be displayed properly, telling the story of the Ventnor, telling the story of those early Chinese miners. Because those early Chinese, they played a great part in the development of New Zealand. And as I say, there is a lot of their the descendants still here in New Zealand, but many of the bones they, uh, of the remains, they, uh, uh, they're unknown people. But anyway, if you have any questions now, <laughs> so uh, I need minutes. to be doing. Hmm? That's okay. I'll Thank get a drink of water. Thank you very much, Keith. That was excellent. Thank you. Uh, and you kept just to time as well. So. We've got a couple of minutes more for, for questions. I should have said at the beginning to chat the questions into me, but I've already had some people chatting questions in as well as you were talking. Um, I've got a, a, a number of, of one of our former students who's up in the mainland at the moment was asking originally to start to ask about whether the bones were there. Of course, she told us you did find the bones. Um, would it be possible, she's saying, is to use some sort of DNA to identify bones and links to families? Or, or do you think that they would be too would the water have affected them in some way? Do you know the science of this? Well, jo John Albert, who's doing still, his big thing is still to do this documentary. He would like to try and find uh, the answers or the relatives in the Sha Kong or the Upper Panyu district who, who were related to these people. But as I say, the big problem is most of the names that we have were really sort of the nicknames as you saw on that memorial. It, um, so he is he is hoping that in some way 
he can make contact with some of those families as, as part of his film documentary he's doing and asking them to what they would prefer happens to those remains. And talking about the DNA, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, DNA of bones that have been underwater can still be extracted more so than bones that have been um, buried on land. So uh, there's apparently there's um, the possibility there if, if it was required. Good, thank you. Thank you, Keith. I'm also being asked questions, more questions about the bones. I think it's interesting, obviously, the whole idea of the remains and, and everything else. Um, when they were discovered, were they disturbed at all in the filming or did you just film them? Yeah. No, as I point out, divers weren't involved. There was no human intervention. It was a robotic camera that that uh, that was there, and uh, it was only limited time too yeah, that we recorded. They were there in respect uh, for those remains. So I haven't shown any. We have never published any of the film or images of those bones in respect to the families and and to those souls that are there. Great, thank you. And another more questions coming into the law side. You mentioned the fact that the New Zealand laws have that sort of fixed date of 1900, don't they, for the protection of wrecks? And and you had to do it had to be a special law brought in to actually protect the SS Ventnor. Although, as you pointed out, um, you know it wasn't really at, at risk from sort of recreational divers or sort of souvenir hunters or anything else. But with the recovery of the Ventnor objects, um, how, how did that? How did you fit that with the, um, I, I think uh, New Zealand actually um, does follow the principles of the International Convention from 2001 on the idea of leaving things in situ. So was that considered at the time of the recovery of the Ventnor objects? Well, the main point uh, recovering those was uh, we knew the wreck was there. We filmed the wreck, but there was questions, especially from uh, from uh, some Chinese people that were there, they they would like they wanted to see something that they could see in their hand. Yes, that saying there is a wreck there, and it is the Ventnor, um, and rather than just taking people's word for it. So, and uh, this was one reason. That, well, the main reason was to, uh, that those objects were recovered. At the at the same time, um, we wanted. Uh, to eventually to try and for museums displays where, in fact, in fact uh, those remains there, like uh, Choi Su Hui's um, great great granddaughter, uh, when she first saw them, she she there was tears and I, to handle those things with her great great grandfather, he really brought a lot of uh, emotion to her. And it was the same when we displayed first displayed the objects was during the time. Uh, that the president uh, Xi Jinping was visiting New Zealand, and there was a lot of uh, Chinese uh, TV company people there. And we we held a when we announced the finding of that, a day there was big interest uh, all over the world. But by having those objects there, it, it brought home to people. People could touch they, some of them when they touched them. They you know it, it really uh, really. Um, connected them to the wreck rather than looking at films and things and uh, the at the present time although it is a uh, uh, an archaeological site um, objects uh, artifacts could still be recovered with a permit from the government it, and John visited China a couple of times he's brought over and he was with officials in Guangzhou and that and the museum and they they were very keen to get some uh, artifacts from that ship to use in a display to help uh, tell the story of how those Chinese people left China way back then, endured hardships, but played a big role in the development of the uh, Pacific countries like uh, California, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, so ho hopefully uh, there will be some discussion on it. But um... Actually, I mean, your point there raises some other points that are coming from questions that people asking questions as well, again, from the legal side, because the wreck is interesting. You know, it, it's in New Zealand waters, but then there's this idea of the International Convention. And of course, it also, we've got China's laws to do with underwater cultural relics, uh, which require 
notification of the Chinese authorities if Chinese relics are found virtually anywhere in the world and if they predate 1911. So uh, again, you know, the, your interaction with the people in Guangzhou, it was interesting that they thought about sort of asking for them to be brought back or whatever there. So it raises a, a number of interesting sort of legal issues in that way. So it's great. I, I think I, I, I need to raise the last uh, the last question or at least comment uh, from one of our uh, lawyer colleagues in Hong Kong, who is from New Zealand. So William Miller has, has asked the question. He said, well, first of all, he said great research, uh, fascinating story, great about the legacy of of China, Hong Kong and New Zealand and linking them all together as well. Uh, but he did say, you know, thinking of another very famous resident of New Zealand who's interested in filming Rex, did you ever hear from James Cameron about this? <laughs> uh, I'll, get, I'll get a copy of my book to him. But but can I can I just just in return just just outline some questions for your people? You know, what is to be the fate of these uh, Chinese bones discovered in the shipwreck? And should be, should they be recovered and resume their journey to as originally attended, so their spirits can be at rest, or be recovered and say reburied in New Zealand, a, a New Zealand grave where descendants can still come and visit and conduct uh, bison, or are they to remain in the wreck, a disintegrating wreck, uh, forever as uh, uh, their spirits remain as um, in the deep as uh, hungry ghosts. So this, you know, we'd be very interested to hear uh, comments on um, on the thoughts along those lines. You know, what 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 do people over in China there, or especially in southern China, feel that should happen to these bones? The the other point too is uh, very quickly, these people are Chinese citizens. They're not New Zealand citizens, and uh, as such. Uh, there's been talk about, oh, well, it's a cemetery, but well, shipwrecks aren't cemeteries, really, you know. They're not. But it, it, as such, uh, you, they're a Chinese national, so it would be, would it be a Chinese-recognised cemetery in New Zealand waters, such such like some war cemeteries in other countries, you know. But, uh, well, I'll try and raise some of those with my students the next time we have a, a seminar and, and I'll refer them because this is being recorded so they can watch your presentation and we can think about that. The idea, I mean, I think the only laws I know of with the UK, we've got um, laws to do with war graves and ships being designated as war graves, you know, when they when they were sunk during battles or whatever else. But um, yeah. Yes, I'm not. I'm not sure. We get we're getting a comment coming in, but technically they're not Chinese citizens either because of the status of China in 1902. So I'm not sure how that would work as well. But uh, okay. I, I think that you, you've raised a number of issues for your own. I mean, I got the feeling in your with the book and your presentation. I think you quite like the idea of them being returned to China. Is that right? We leave that to the Chinese people. I think uh, uh, it's really a decision for the. Chinese government, or then to the relatives, and uh, and with the New Zealand government to decide. I think how how it should be handled. It's uh, yeah, rather. Um, there was one last slide. One. There, there was uh, you, very quickly uh, yeah, because it's uh, it's got your details. If anyone's interested in a copy of the book, so if you can. Share there is one please. quick slide here, um, Steve. Uh, whether we can just pop it up. Um, my 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 email address is there. Um, if anybody is in it, they can email me and uh, we can try and sort out how wherever they are, if they are the cost and that. Unfortunately, mailing costs are a problem these days. So uh, often it's good if there's two or three books ordered at once rather than one singular one, you know, for people together. But anyway, uh, most welcome to email me at that address and we can discuss, uh, uh, you know, what yeah. they would like to do. And if anyone didn't get the email there, we, we'll be putting the recording up as well, and they can always contact us here, and I can pass on your details as well about the book. But um, yeah, uh, your question again about the return of the remains. In Hong Kong, we've already got remains still that were, because of the revolution and, and everything else, we've got in our Sandy Bay um, in the coffee room at the Tung Wah, uh funeral home there, we've still got remains that were was in, in this sort of limbo in Hong Kong as well. So it's an interesting topic in itself. But thank you very much, Keith. That was really brilliant. I know 
Uh, thank you very much, Kim, and thank you also to Dave. I know he's there as well, supporting you as well. But